Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 36 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. All forums are free and open to the public. Information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Dr. Eddie Cloud, Jr. is the William S. Todd Professor of Religion and African American Studies at Princeton University and chair of its Department of African American Studies. Born and raised in the coastal town of Moss Point, Mississippi, and he told me just before we came out that there are seven people who were who are from Moss Point, who are in Minneapolis, who are here today. So thank you, Moss Point, for being here. From, from Moss Point, Mississippi, he went to Morehouse College at the age of 16. He graduated with a degree in political science, then earned a master's degree in African American studies from Temple University, and a PhD in religion from Princeton University. He's the author of the award-winning book, in a Shade of Blue, Pragmatism and the Politics of Black America, and co-editor with Cornell West, a previous forum speaker some years ago, of African American Religious Thought, an anthology. His latest book is Democracy in Black, How Race Still Enslaves the Soul of America. He has described his vision of what it means to be a public intellectual, to be in love with ideas with the aim of making the world better. Today, he will speak about the deep impact of race on the soul of America. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Dr. Eddie Gloud, Jr. How y'all doing? I'm a, I'm a country boy from, from Mississippi, and uh, I can't begin to tell you how honored I am to have some of my home peoples <laughs> here. Could y'all stand up if you're here from, these are folks from Moss Point. Sometimes folks want to know your journey. How did you come from this small town and end up at Princeton? Well, it has something to do with the powerful people in that small town, uh, some of whom have landed in this beautiful city. So I want to thank you all for coming out to support me. Reverend Hart Anderson, thank you for your prophetic witness for this amazing congregation, for this extraordinary institution. I want to thank Shelley and Lindy, Linda. For, for, for being so wonderful and getting me from the Hyatt Regency. We took that walk <laughs> through all that construction to get here. Thank you for the lovely music to kind of bless this space as we begin to make this hard journey together. I want to thank all the staff, all the folks behind the scenes that have made this possible. It's been a complicated couple of hours for me. I started this journey yesterday at four o'clock in the morning on my way to Morning Joe to talk about Hillary Clinton's pneumonia <laughs> and the buck and the basket of deplorables. <laughs> and then I found myself on Al Jazeera talking about, again, Hillary Clinton's pneumonia and the basket of deplorables. And then I gave a major lecture with all of the high uh, people in the humanities at Princeton and then I found myself in a car flying to, uh, flying to the airport to get here, and now I'm with you. Uh, it's a blessing, and I hope that what I have to say uh, will uh, prick your imaginations, will provoke you, because these are dark times, yes? Ralph Waldo Emerson tells us that God speaks through our imaginations. I love telling my students that. I often ask them, though, if this is true, then what is the devil doing? 
In so many ways, at least this is what I try to suggest in my work and in my witness, that we are experiencing in this country, in this moment, a crisis of imagination. And I mean by this something more than a failure to be creative, but something much more about who we take ourselves to be. That something about who we are as Americans has gone out of focus. There's some sort of major moral failing defines our way of being in the world. Now, to my mind, imagination registers much more than creativity and the ability to trade in that which isn't real, the fantastical, right? Imagination is something more than that. And here I'm thinking about that moment. I'm going to be a professor now. In Shelley's a great defense, his, in Shelley's defense of poetry, he writes, quote, a man to be greatly good must imagine intensely and comprehensively. He must put himself in the place of another and of many others. The great instrument of moral good, Pastor, the great instrument of moral good is the imagination. Here, imagination involves an ability to see the as yet, a willingness to look beyond the opacity of now, to see what's possible. Imagination involves a kind of empathetic projection what my favorite philosopher John Dewey describes as that animating moral judgment, that is feeling our way beyond the narrow consideration of ours alone to take up the concerns and aspirations of others. Shelley's point, the great instrument of moral good is the imagination. That claim understood in the context of this claim, we are experiencing a crisis of imagination. We find ourselves in these dark times unable to imagine the world otherwise. The world as it is seems to be our permanent docking station. It not only blocks our ability to see what's possible, it impairs our ability to empathize with those who are not us, inverted commas. Y'all all right? I'm just checking on you. I went to Morehouse, so there's some Baptist waters in me, <laughs> you know. This crisis of imagination says something about our characters, who we take ourselves to be. Remember, imagination is bound up with that ability to empathize, sympathize with others, to see yourself, right, in someone who's not you, right? Putting oneself in the place of another and of many others, right? But we live in a time where the superordinate value seems to be putting oneself over and against another. So all we need to think about is our presidential election. We saw what happened in Asheville, North Carolina last night, yes? Folks throwing punches at each other, claiming that folks are bigots, that folks are ugly at the core that they're going to take America back, make America great again, and doing so in the name of a kind of ugliness that I find deplorable. Oh, there's that word. <laughs> but I want to take this back. I want to take it out of the easy target, at least for someone like myself, of Donald Trump. I want to think about this in the broader context of, you, of the United States. We live in a society where we can tell ourselves that we've turned an economic corner, that we have come out of the Great Recession. And when you look at black and brown communities in this country, when you turn your attention to those who are not, quote unquote, one of you, what do we see? Uh, we don't see a community that's come out of right, depression or uh, come out of economic recession. We see a community struggling to make ends meet. right? I interviewed a young woman by the name of Christine Frazier. Uh, I write about this in the book. And Christine uh, did every, played, every, played by the rules, did everything right, right? Her husband died. She lost her job, and she couldn't make ends meet. She couldn't pay her house note. And, and the sheriff's office came in the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning, and they unlocked the door. And they told her and her, grandma, her mother and her daughter and her grandson to get out. And they proceeded to empty the house of a lifetime worth of memory to put all of it in the yard. She said, they came into my home like I was a drug dealer, but they knew that dogs were there. 
And she said they told her they didn't, she, they didn't have anything, any place for her to go. And they said to her, you have to figure out what you're going to do. But they knew dogs were there. So they called Animal Shelter. And she said, the pain of losing the house was one thing. They came with the place for my dog. We live in a country right, where we can talk about turning a corner, but there are people right in our midst right, who are struggling to make ends meet, people who are working hard, who are honest, who are trying to make ends meet, but we disremember. We think it's their fault. So in the book, I talk about the Great Black Depression. I talk about the fact that black folk lost their homes, over 240,000 homes lost as a result of the collapse of the housing market. I talk about right, the fact that over 38%, 40% of black children are growing up in poverty. I talk about the downward mobility as African Americans experience the loss of incomes, the inability to dream big dreams for their children because they can't make ends meet. And we live in a country Right? This says we've turned the corner. Right? But let me say this really quickly. Y'all all right? I don't know why you invited me here. I'm going to tell the truth. <laughs> I'm going to tell the truth. In my mind, democracies require particular kinds of dispositions to work. But something has distorted and disfigured our national and individual character. Remember I said there's a crisis of imagination. Imagination involves what? Not only just simply the fantastical and the creative. The imagination involves what? This ability, right, to see oneself, put oneself in the position of another. That it has something to do with our characters. I want to say that something has distorted and disfigured who we take ourselves to be. And I call it the value gap. Now I'm about to get into the substance of it, taking my watch off, right? <laughs> what is the value gap? The value gap is the belief that white people are valued more than others. Oh, I'm going to say it again. The value gap is the belief that white people are valued more than others. And this belief isn't the possession of loud races, people running around with white sheets over their heads or swastikas tattooed on parts of their body. Rather, this belief animates our social practices, our political arrangements, and our economic realities. This belief that white people matter more than others distorts our characters and dis deform our democracy. I like to tell the story of, of, of my father, who was the second African-American hired at the post office in Pascagoula, Mississippi, the place where uh, William Faulkner honeymooned. <laughs> and back then, getting hired at the post office was high cotton, right? And so he knew he had precocious kids, so he decided to move us from the east side of Moss Point to the west side, <laughs> on a hill, Briarwood Circle. And as we were moving into that house, I'm playing with my Tonka truck. You remember those old Tonka trucks? I'm playing with my Tonka dump, dump truck, and, and I'm making my dump truck noises, and all of a sudden I hear an adult say, stop playing with that nigga. And it's the first time I had been called that word in that context. So I grabbed my truck, and I took it inside, and I took it to my father, my father who doesn't suffer white people easily. Right? Ran outside, and he did whatever he did. But that's how we typically tell the story of American racism, right? Some black family achieves the American dream. They move to a big house on a hill, and then some child is wounded by some mean-spirited adult who calls them the N-word, and then that child has to work all of her life to prove that she's not that. Oh. But that's too easy. It's too melodramatic. It's too all my children-like my mother's favorite soap opera. <laughs> because I already knew at the age of eight and nine years old that we were moving from the black side of town to the white side of town. I already knew because Rose Drive, where we used to live, because the pipes are bad, every time it rained, it flooded. I already knew because the sidewalks weren't, as as the sidewalks weren't paved like they were on the west side. The baseball diamond wasn't cut as regularly as it was on the other side. The houses were smaller. The schools weren't as fine as the town. That side of town was subject to layoffs by Ingalls, the shipyard, paper mill. I already knew in the very built environment that something said that those folk over there were less valued than those folk over here. 
Hmm? We want to look for the bad racist, right? The obvious racist, but we are making choices day in and day out, right? That sustain racial inequality in this country. My colleague Imani Perry calls it a cultural practice of inequality. Let me give you an example of what I mean. I believe the planet is actually getting warmer. <laughs> All right, you feel me? It's hottest summer on record, hottest year on record. But if you look at my house, and you look at my car, and you look at my light bulbs, you look at the way I live my life, the daily choices I make, you would think I believe the planet was all right. My day-to-day -day behavior suggests that I am a climate change denier. So there are folks running around here who are saying that they are committed to racial inequality, a racial equality, but their choices. I just want my kids to go to the best schools. Social sciences have already, the social science has already said that whenever you hear that phrase, it's usually a proxy for how many black and brown kids attend my school. I want my neighborhood to be safe. We know what that means. I want my property values to stay. We know what that means. Right? So it's in the kind of order, the cultural practice, the value gap is, is, is evidenced. Let me give you a quote from James Baldwin in The Uses of the Blues. Y'all all right? Baldwin clearly states what he takes to be the Negro problem. I'm talking about what happens to you. If you've barely escaped suicide or death or madness or yourself, you watch your children growing up, and no matter what you do, no matter what you do, you are powerless. You are really powerless against the force of the world that is out to tell your child that he has no right to be alive, and no amount of liberal jargon, no amount of talking about how well and how far we have progressed does anything to soften or to point out any solution to this dilemma. In every generation, ever since Negroes have been here, Baldwin writes, every Negro mother and father has had to face that child and try to create in that child some way of surviving this particular world some way to make the child who will be despised not despise himself. I don't know what the Negro problem means to white people, Baldwin writes, but this is what it means to the Negro. What does it mean to try to construct an idea of the self in a country that is organized in every single way on the basis, on the grounds of the value gap? Not because people are mean-spirited, but it's because it's in the very DNA of the country. And this is what makes addressing the problem, I'm leaving my notes now, this is what makes addressing the problem of white supremacy, of racial inequality in this country so difficult because we refuse to look the ugliness of who we are squarely in the face and dare to imagine ourselves differently. This is hard work. This is hard. The value gap isn't sustained by loud races. The value gap is sustained by all of us. All of us. You, you don't need white people for white supremacy to work. When I'm in New Jersey and I'm driving down Stuyvesant Avenue in Trenton, I hold a set of generalizations about the people who occupy that particular neighborhood. It's known as Little Iraq. I keep my head on a swivel. Right? There's a kind of particular fear that gets generalized, that gener is generalized to an entire population that informs a set of assumptions about how I interact with them. And those generalizations have policy implications. We are socialized and habituated into believing, right, certain things about certain folks. Right? I write about this in the text. There are... Uh, Nancy DeTomaso uh, at, at Rutgers, a social scientist, she did a series of interviews of white working class folk uh, in Cleveland, in Ohio, and in Tennessee, and in Jersey, I believe. And she said she was interviewing these workers, and, and one worker said, I just, I'm sorry, I'm, black people are just lazy. They just want a handout. You've heard this before. It's been informing public discourse since I can remember remembering. And they don't want to work hard for anything. And it turned out that his father was close friends with the union boss who hooked him up with a job. 
another interviewer, right? I'm sorry to say, they're just lazy. They don't want to work. It turns out that not only his friend gave him, the, gave him the test that he needed to take for his job, gave him the answers to the test. And what Nancy's trying to suggest in this moment is, right, not that there is some, right, op overt racism that's happening. People are just hooking up their friend, friends and families, right? You're that it's what she calls opportunity hoarding, that racial inequality actually is, is uh, perpetuated through social networks, right? And because we're so deeply a segregated society, social net, our social networks are typically, 75% of our social networks are 100% homogeneous. So opportunities pass through certain networks that do not pass through others, right? I'm just helping out my child. I'm not being racist. Right? I'm just helping out my neighbor. I'm not being racist. I said something jokingly to a friend the other night. I said, if we want to solve black-on-black -black crime in the United States, we just need to integrate neighborhoods. And they didn't quite get it. I said, <laughs> some of you didn't get it either, right? Most crime takes place right, because of proximity. White on white crime, 83% of crime that happens in white communities happens between white and on white people. 91% happens between, because our neighborhoods are segregated. If we all move together, then we'll just be criminal with each other. I don't know. <laughs> Racial habits. The value gap distorts who we take ourselves to be. It blocks the way to the formation of the kinds of people democracies require. I was just talking about, uh, with, with Reverend Hart Anderson, about Abraham Lincoln's rejection of the monstrous injustice of slavery, but his commitment to the belief that white people were superior than black people, and how those commitments blocked the way from him becoming the kind of human being his idea of democracy required. What does it mean in our country that we can hold the ideals of democracy and when those ideals are extended to black and brown people, we are willing to erode the social safety net? Right. Welfare, for much of the New Deal, right, was in fact a project of Southern Dixiecrats aimed at addressing poor white Southerners. But the moment the face of the welfare state became black, as my colleague Martin Gillens writes. It became right, an emblem of the problem with big government. What happens when we're willing to turn our backs on an idea, a robust idea of the public good because it involves people who are not like us? It means that we're willing to throw democracy into the trash bin over, over the idea, over our commitment to the idea that some people, because of the color of their skin, are valued more than others. It's the value gap is at the heart of our problem. The value gap is evidenced in our habits, habits of living, habits that define where we live, where we work. I can't begin to tell you how often I'm having to, I have to leave the particularity of my experience at the door in order to make white people comfortable. It's almost as if, as James Baldwin writes in Notes of a Native Son, we have to make ourselves blank in order to wash away your guilt. And so we dance this dance, America's racial theater. It's this dance so that you can't be called a racist and I can't trigger your fears. Huh? The worst thing that you can be called is a racist, even though everything that's coming out of your mouth, Donald Trump suggests otherwise. Right? We find ourselves in this dance, unwilling to confront the ugliness of who we are. Just think about this. The last piece of great legislation uh, passed in the great society was the 1968 Fair Housing Act. I'm watching my time. Twelve years later, Ronald Reagan is elected. Twelve years later, there is the triumph of a political ideology designed to undo the great society and the New Deal. Did we fix the country in 12 years? 1965, the Voting Rights Act, right? By 1980, wholesale attack. We don't need to protect them anymore, right? Shelby, 
we don't need to do it. And what happens after the Shelby decision recently, right? We get a proliferation of attacks on voter registration, voter IDs, right? Think about it. At every turn, at every moment of progress in this country, we have seen a reassertion of the value gap. At the moment in which we give voice to the principles of liberty and equality, right, in the context of the American Revolution, what do we get in response? We reconcile those principles with racial slavery. John Adams, it is said, said to King George, we will not be your Negroes. At the very moment in which he's giving voice to an idea of freedom, it's predicated upon an intimate understanding of unfreedom a reassertion of the value gap. In the moment of radical reconstruction, we offer right, a vision of multiracial democracy. What do we get in response to radical reconstruction? We get convict leasing, right? Convict leasing. You wouldn't have the city of Birmingham without the labor, the forced labor of convicts, quote unquote. People arrested for what reason, right? Slavery by another name. As Brother Blackman talked, and you get Jim Crow and a reassertion of the value gap. In the context, right, of the black freedom struggle of the mid-20th century, everyday ordinary people demanding dignity and standing, what do we get in response? We get the tax revolt in Northern California. And we get calls for law and order. Value gap. What do we get when we elect our first black president and we think we turned a corner? We get the vitriol of the Tea Party. And we get a wholesale attack, right? on the voting rights of black and brown peoples. At every turn, at every moment of progress, we, that progress is arrested by a reassertion of the value gap. We have to do the work, but we're afraid. We are afraid. White fear has driven this country since its founding. Think about Rep. Thomas Jefferson's notes of the state of Virginia. I'm going to come home. I'm trying to get there. Right? Think about it. He said, I tremble for this country because of the sin of slavery. Right? He was afraid of what that meant, the divine punishment that would come for holding another human being in slavery. And he writes that particular formulation in the section on habit formation. Because he said, what happens to a child who witnesses the violence of slavery? Something is broken on the inside of such a child who experiences that. Something happens to their character, Jefferson suggests. But in that moment of fear, right, it drives policy. Think about, right, the fear of Abraham Lincoln in the second inaugural, supposedly the second founding. Think about the fear surrounding black rage with the Black Panther Party, you know, that cover of the New Yorker where they had Obama dressed as a Muslim and Michelle Obama as Angela Davis. And they were bumping fists, and people were like, what does that mean? Did they just, they bumped fists. Did the black people just begin revolution? <laughs> Fear. Fear drives policy. The moral panic surrounds the so-called super predators, where the, the data suggested was not true. What did the moral panics do? It drove mass incarceration. Think about what happened with the Central Park Five. Those babies were innocent, their lives stolen. Think about all the millions of folk who are locked up because of fear, fear driving policy. We can no longer be afraid. And that fear actually drives our political behavior, black political behavior. As I said earlier, we're afraid to trigger your fears. So we will grit our teeth in the moment which you say something a little off color. Our fear of triggering white fear affects our behavior. So we're masking day in and day out, walking past each other, not really seeing the humanity of, our, of the person right in front of us. No wonder we're stuck. Hmm? But Malcolm X said this, and I'm going to say this in front of you guys and make you mad, I don't care. We have to stop sweet talking. Tell you how we really feel. Tell you what kind of hell we've been catching and let you know if you shouldn't have a, if you don't clean up your house, if you're not ready to clean up your house, you shouldn't have a house. It should catch on fire and burn down. Now, I'm not trying to burn down anybody's house. 
But what Malcolm is talking about is frank speech. That we have to confront each other honestly. One of the most exhausting things I have to do is to convince my fellow white citizens of what is happening. Every time we have to engage in this haunting public ritual of grieving in public, we got to convince you that it happened. What does it mean that Diamond Reynolds' four-year-old baby had to muster the resources to comfort her mother in that moment? I'm here, mama. I'm here with you. What does it mean that Alton Sterling's 15-year-old baby is crying, weeping, because he lost his father, wouldn't see him again? What does it mean that if it wasn't for the footage around Walter Scott, that police officer would still be walking the streets? What does it mean that I have to tell my child right, the story of how to interact with the police because I want him to come home? What does it mean that here I am, I've done everything right, I'm at the height of my profession, I'm the president of the American Academy of Religion. The day I got the call for that that I won, my baby calls me from Brown to tell me that he's sitting on a bench doing an assignment and a police officer drives up, blocks his way, his way out, comes out and says, who are you and why are you here? He says, I'm a Brown student just doing an assignment. The police officer hits him in the face with the, with the flashlight, looks at his feet, looks at the bushes, and tells him the park closes at 9.30. And my son says, yes, sir, but it's only 6.30. And then the partner, his partner, walks around the police cruiser and says to him, and both of them lean in with their hands on their weapon and say to him, the park closes at 9.30. And my son puts up his hands and says, we don't want any trouble. I could have lost my only child that day. And I got to convince you of what that means. We're not going to fundamentally change unless we look ourselves squarely in the face. You learn race in Minneapolis by just simply driving around this community. It's in the very built environment. You don't have to be a bad person. It's how we are habituated as citizens of this country, a country that has been drenched right, in the reality of white supremacy. We have to address it. We have to address it if we're going to get beyond it. So what I call for is a revolution of value. We need to change our view of government by changing our demand of government. We need to change our view of black people by changing our view of white people, and only white people can do that. And we need to change what ultimately matters to us. If we have a society predicated upon greed and narcissism and selfishness, we will continue to produce the likes of Donald Trump. But it's in our hands. I refuse to dance the dance any longer. For my grandchildren who are not here, I refuse to try to make you feel comfortable. Because I know of a man who was crucified on Calvary, who refused to become adjusted to injustice. What does it mean to bear witness to the virtues of generosity and humility and justice in this moment? It will require something monumental of us, something profound. Value gap, racial habits, fear, requires of us a commitment to democracy in this sense, we have to become the people that democracy requires of us. That means we have to reject the idea that this is God's gift to the world, that is America, is the shining city on the hill, that rigs the argument. No, we need to look ourselves squarely in the face, in great pain and terror, and do the work of actually achieving our country. I pray that we do so.
Because if we don't, we will certainly see the fire next time. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Professor Cloud. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister here at Westminster Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is Dr. Eddie Cloud, Jr. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to thank our broadcast partner, the statewide network of Minnesota Public Radio News, heard in the Twin Cities on 91.1 FM, and the co-sponsors of today's forum, Hennepin County Library, with funding from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, and the online news source, MinPost. We invite you to join us for our next forum on Tuesday, October 18th at 7 p.m., when Glennon Doyle Melton will be our speaker. Further information is available on our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, Professor Cloud, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. Your most recent book is entitled Democracy in Black. Right. What does democracy in black look like? Well, it's, this, it's the effort on the part of, of everyday ordinary black folk, along with their allies, to expand the notion that this is a country of the people, for the people, and by the people, by expanding who we take those people to be, right? So Lincoln gives us a definition of what democracy is in that moment. But you know, it's in that in attempt to expand who we take the demos to be. That is democracy in black. And in some ways, it's an echo of Howard Thurman's wonderful, the great theologian Howard Thurman. Uh, who said that the slave dared to redeem the religion profaned in its midst. And I want to suggest that African Americans have dared to redeem the, the political ideology of democracy, often profaned in their midst. That's democracy in black. Martin Luther King was most frustrated with those who praised his goals but cautioned patience and moderation, the letter from Birmingham jail. Yeah. What specific advice would you offer white people who are inclined toward moderation in watching events from the sidelines? <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. <laughs> One of the beautiful things about Black Lives Matter, no matter what you think about their, their tactics, what do you think about their ideology, is that they're engaged in a politics of disruption. They're engaged in a politics of disruption. And so no one can sit on the sidelines. The top one-tenth of a percent can't have their brunch on Sunday in Manhattan without them showing up. You can't drive to work or drive home without them suddenly break, shutting down a highway. You can't even walk into the union building at your local police station at, 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 uh, in New York without them locking arms and, and blocking the entryway. It's a politics of disruption designed to make us all uncomfortable. But let me just say this. If you're concerned about justice, you know, if you're committed to this justice work, right, there's no way you can sit on the sidelines. And if you do, um, then you are complicit in evil. That's as strong as I could put it. You speak a lot about fear, fear of one another, and uh, the habit of fear into which we have fallen over these generations. How do we, black folk and white folks, how do we set aside fear? How do we deal with that? We've got a lot, of, a lot of questions about that. Yeah, you know, I mean, we have to understand our power. Every election cycle, they want us to, all of us, to vote from a place of fear, as opposed to a position of power. They want us to believe that democracy is really about the beltway and not about us, right? They want us to believe that democracy is about the beltway and not about us. The beauty of the Bernie Sanders campaign, didn't Minnesota go for Bernie Sanders? 
The beauty of the Bernie Sanders campaign is that it revealed that if we're organized, we can produce better choices. People get it twisted. They think Bernie caused the, the energy. In fact, the energy caused Bernie. Right? When we understand our power, we don't have to occupy Zuccotti Park. But we can understand the power of everyday ordinary folks standing in, standing in solidarity with each other. White workers, black workers, all of our wages have been stagnated. White workers, brown workers, black workers, all of our homes aren't worth a damn. All of us can't afford to send our kids to college. All of us would love to have a living wage. All of us would love not to have crooked politicians robbing the public coffers in the name of their own private greed. Right? What we are facing, and I'm going to be really quick here, no I'm not. What we're facing here is, is, is seriously what the new economy represents. The new economy doesn't care, right, that you're committed to the value gap. The new economy, right, has produced all of these white folks who are increasing suicidality, strung out on opioids, right, trying to figure out their future. And then they've migrated a discourse, you've read that book on white trash? They've migrated a discourse of, of personal responsibility and dysfunctionality to white poor workers, white poor, poor people. See, they don't, they're not responsible. They just want a handout. They're strung out on drugs. They're lazy, right? There is a sense in which we can stand in solidarity together if, and David Brooks just talked about this in his column just the other day, if we can give up the racial wedge issues, if we can give up the value gap, we got to vote from a position of power. We got to act from a position of power, not from a place of fear. Question from a student, apologizing that she, or she or he has written this in orange, but I think I can read it. <laughs> I'm white, as is my family. They feel deeply that they have experienced racism toward themselves. How do I speak to them about telling them this is wrong? You know, Donald Trump just used this formulation in response to Hillary Clinton's claim about the basket of deplorables. That there's, she, he said in response that she expressed bigotry, right, and prejudice toward a large number of Americans, right? And this has been one of the interesting rhetorical shifts since the 1960s of, uh, of describing white people as the victims of racial discrimination. And it's really a critical, critical feature of the alt-right, which is just the latest branding of white nationalist. Right? That is to say that wherever you see anti-racist or anti-racist policy and organizing, they believe anti-racism is anti-white. Right? And we wanna, what we have to do is historicize that, that formulation to show what it's really trying to do is to get people to invest in the value gap, right? To get people to invest in the idea that whiteness accords you a special set of benefits. And let me say this, as long as we believe that racial equality is a zero-sum game, we will continuously find ourselves in this moment. If racial equality means simply taking stuff from white people, and giving it to undeserving black people or brown people, then we will continuously produce this kind of resentment. So we have to tell the truth. It's not about taking stuff from deserving people and giving it to undeserving people. It's about justice. It's about a society predicated upon just arrangements. If you think historic double-digit unemployment in black communities is the result of black people being lazy, then you're actively disremembering. The fact that we were locked out of labor unions, the fact that we were locked out of specific sectors of the economy, right? The fact that my daddy couldn't go to Princeton, couldn't be there. If you think a dual housing market, the fact that the wealth gap is 13 times, white wealth is 13 times that of black wealth, if you think that's because black people are lazy, then you don't understand the history of residential segregation in this country how we couldn't gain access, even if we fought for the nation of overseas in World War II, we couldn't gain access to mortgages. There is a history, right, of discrimination that defines inequality in this country. So we have to not disremember, we have to tell the truth. That's a long-winded answer, but you got it, I hope. 
Who's the successor to Martin Luther King Jr. and when is he or she going to take up that mantle? Or is there a successor? In your book you talk about Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, Reverend Barber. Yeah, I'm kind of H-N-I-C. Oh, H-N-I-C. Look at Rev. You hear me? You see Rev? I read the book. I'm going to get some mileage out of it. Uh, yeah, I, we don't need another Martin King. Hold on. Listen to what I mean. We are the leaders we've been looking for. You see? And, 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 and Rev, I'm going to put it in, in Christian language just for a moment, right? We want to, we, we wanna, you know, we, it's inscribed on the soul. It's inscribed on the heart. We don't want priestly models. All of you got it. You see, and this comes from my, the, 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 the inspiration to the, for the entire book is Miss Ella Baker, the great organizer who, who, who gave room for the formation of SNCC, right, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She had a fundamental faith in the capacities of everyday ordinary people, right, that if we give them the space, it's a quick story, quick story, they're going to register to vote in Ruleville, Mississippi, and folk are scared out of their wits. Bob, the great Bob Moses told me this story. Folks are scared because they knew what they were driving into. And this person in the back of the bus was singing, saying every spiritual she knew. And then they realized what she was doing. She was trying to make, she was fortifying their spirits, trying to give them courage. And this was a sharecropper. It turned out to be Miss Fannie Lou Hamer. Everyday ordinary folks, we are the giants. We don't need anyone to lead us. We can lead ourselves. Come on. Come on. Tavis Smiley spoke recently here at the Town Hall Forum. He reported that the position of African Americans has actually declined economically in other ways during the eight-year tenure of our first African American president. Why is that? Somebody trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> in the book, I'm hard on President Obama. I'm hard on him. I call him a Melvillian confidence man selling the snake oil of hope and change. The last eight years have been rough. You know, I'm from the South. Um, and, you know, as we, as, as we were prone to say, when we look at the back of his head, we're going to face and confront the ruins of our communities. Um, Julianne Malveaux has written a, an extraordinary text entitled, Are We Better Off? And she says, in effect, uh, 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 no. Right? I mean, he's stemmed the tide of, of the loss of jobs. But when we look at the, very, when we look at the quality of life data, right, black folk aren't doing better. Right? And, and what I, what what I want to suggest is, is that he, he was constrained by not only the forces in the beltway, but he was also constrained by his own choices. I think after the Republicans took hold of the Congress, there's no reason to try to be postpartisan. Go big, go bold, change the frame. There's a reason why Wall Street has been making historic profits over the last eight years. And Main Street still finds its wages flatline. There's a reason why Barack Obama in his last State of the Union was talking about the implication of inequality for the new economy. He understands what it means for everyday ordinary workers, but he hasn't changed the frame. He hasn't changed the frame. To my mind, Barack Obama is just simply a centrist, democratic, let me say it different. He's a centrist version of the DLC, the Democratic Leadership Council. He's just the latest extension of Clintonism. Now, I know we can fight over that. And that's what I want us to do, because this is what happened. We talked about this. Prior to 2008, there was a lot of grassroots energy out there with regards to the war. Remember this? Massive demonstrations in the streets and organizing in the streets. And before the anti-Iraq -Iraq war protests, we had the WTO protest in Seattle. Folk were organizing across the country, trying to challenge the stranglehold of a certain neoliberal economic policy right on the country. Barack Obama jumped in front of it, and he, we green screened him. You know this TV green screen? We made him everything we wanted him to be. We wanted him to be 
right, the anti-war president. We wanted him to be, right, a populist in terms of his economic policies. And when you, but when you read the audacity of Oak, he is who he is, who he said he was. And what happened when he got elected in 2008? We demobilized. We had to figure out what we were going to do. And it wasn't until Zuccotti Park and Occupy that we got that energy back. And then Black Lives Matter, again. So part of, it's a long-winded answer. I think we can, we look at the data, uh, we can answer the question that we have not improved, and much of it has to do with the fact that Barack Obama could not be seen as the black president, and two, because he is who he is. He's a centrist Democrat, invested in the frame as it is. And I'm not a centrist Democrat. <laughs> and that's not to take away from the fact that he's the first black president in the history of the country. My baby grew up looking at him. But symbol is not substance. We have time for one more question with a short-winded answer. How can we get two more? <laughs> You've got a lot of energy for change. Yes, and, sir. And I hear in that energy hopefulness for America in spite of all of this. Where do you find hope? In us. There's a wonderful line in W.B. Du Bois' uh, Souls of Black Folk. If you haven't read it, go read it. Um, he calls it a hope, not hope, a hope unhopeful, but not hopeless. A hope unhopeful, but not hopeless. That's a blues-soaked hope. That's a hope that comes out of the tradition I come out of. That's a Bobby Blue Bland kind of hope. That's 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 BB King saying nobody loves me but my mother, and she can be jiving too. <laughs> it's a blues-soaked hope. Right? And that's how you can see beyond the opacity of now. That's my faith. My faith is in us because at the end of the day, it's in our hands. Together, you and me, together, it's in our hands. Thank you, Eddie Glaub, Jr.